Hey everybody, it's your host, Pete A. Turner from the Break It Down Show. And I am excited to introduce our guest. But first, I want to say a couple things about a co-host from today. It's Hilliard Guest. He's a good friend of mine, and I love spending time with him. He's a Hollywood screenwriter, and we always meet at his office on the lot, and he hosts us. Now, for this particular episode, he said, hey, listen, I don't got time to jump in. You know, I love you guys, but I got to work. Well, I set up a mic anyhow because I know Hilliard. And as soon as we started talking about screenwriting, today's guest is a screenwriter. He'd get up out of that chair and come over, and sure enough, about 10 minutes in, he does. And we all get a big laugh because I knew the future, and it's always funny when those things happen. I cannot say enough wonderful things about Hilliard. That's why I love sharing him with you all, because he gives us all such treasures when he writes, but also his personality. He just makes me smile, and I promise you, the entire day, I was smiling, enjoying having time with him and hearing him talk. Also co-hosting, co-producing today is Scott Husing, the award-winning, best-selling author who's as much a part of the show as John or I now. It's always fun to have Scott out on the road. We have such a great time, and these are like life-rewarding experiences. So hopefully you all hear that when we go through today's episode with our guest, get this. (laughs) This is great. Jason Keller. Who's Jason Keller? He wrote Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, he shares a writing credit. I want to be fair with John and Jez Butterworth. The Butterworth brothers have written James Bond movies, all kinds of things. Hopefully we'll get one or both of the brothers on the show soon too. But today our guest is Jason Keller talking about how he picked up this story from a major studio. They said, give it a shot. And he fell in love with these characters. And it's turned into a four-time Oscar-nominated movie. Best picture, best sound, and picture editing, best mixing. So you know this is a hell of a story. And Jason is a fantastic dude. What a great guy. You're going to absolutely love what he has to talk about, especially when he and Hilliard start talking about the whole writing game. Share the show. You see the things that we're doing, the opportunities we're creating. Share the show. Be proud of it. This is your show, too. Share it. Talk about it. Recommend it to a friend. Here is one of the top movies in the world. And we've got the screenwriter, the storyteller right here. So share the show, buy the shirts. If you want to support us in some other way, send me an email or send me a text or tweet at me at P. Day Turner. I am not hard to find. All right. One more thing. And you know what's coming now. Savethebrave.org. Find a way to contribute. If we're not your charity, find a charity to make your charity and give them your time, your money, your attention, your presence, your shares. These things matter. These things matter. We've got a great show coming up from the Charity on Top Ladies and show you more ways to contribute with charity. But those things matter. Time, attention, money, all of these things all add up. All right, savethebrave.org. Remember to do that. Jason Keller comes on now. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> uh, hey, this is Jason Keller. You're listening to The Break It Down Show. Holy shit, the guy that wrote Ford vs. Ferrari is sitting in front of Scott and I right now. <laughs> right there. Go, come on. So, come on. <laughs> I'm a race car guy. I have a, My friends and I have a shitty race car, and we oh, drive really? it all the time. And so we love these kinds of movies. And I'm amazed, and Scott proved a point to me, I'm amazed you can even get a movie like this made because it's about Le Mans racing, and yeah. endurance racing is so different than NASCAR and so different than Formula One. Like the whole... The whole thing about endurance racing, as a guy that does it, is you can't you you can drive the car faster, but it absolutely will break sooner. You right. know, so you're always right. trying to find that point of performance, fuel economy, and then to keeping the gearbox from being a thousand right. pieces. Yeah, so we were we were talking. To, how, how do you get a movie like that made in in a market that maybe is not keen on car racing? But yeah. and I cited a bunch of examples. But what was yeah. your driving factor? That's a good pun, by the way. Oh, that's nice. That was a good I caught pun. that. Um, well, I mean, I also want to talk to you about being an actual race car driver. Okay. I mean, that's kind of, you know, yeah. I'm a, I'm a writer who wrote a movie about race cars, but you actually have raced race cars, which I haven't done really. It, you know, th- this was, it was a tricky one to get made. I mean, it took, I came out of the project 10 years ago, you know, I, I, and it, and that people always love the story. You know, it's a true story. I think it was one of the great sporting stories of the, you know, 20th century, really. I mean, it just was so full of character. And, so, you know, it was, you know, it was just rich at every level. But 
it wasn't a sort of franchisable title. It involved period race car, period race cars, which, you know, would have had to have been built, yeah. you know, which they did. It was very difficult. You know, what happened was, you know, years and years of writing that script, and, and I share a writing credit with the Butterworth brothers who came in and, and you know, did some great work on it. It kept um, distilling down to the characters. You know, it, it went from a big race car movie with a great story at its center and great characters at its center. It, it, it started to distill down to what eventually became Carol Shelby and Ken Miles and their relationship. And that was really, you know, what, you know, one of the things that, that enabled that movie to get made is that it was this beautiful sort of love story between two guys. You know what I mean? And guy like James Mangold comes along and says he wants to direct that for his next movie. And, you know, he gets two fantastic actors to play Shelby and Miles. And, you know, he's sort of off to the races. But I think the thing that always, that we always loved, and, and I'm talking about everybody who was involved in this movie for the last 10 years, you know, was that there were characters at the center of this story that were real characters that were compelling and and that's really what kept it alive, I think, for sure. the last decade. Yeah, I, you know? I mean, characters drive everything. Of course. A yeah. Absolutely. I, I don't know. What, did you love racing movies growing up? Do you, do you have a few that you compare, mm. that your film gets compared to, that yeah, people I, you throw know, out there? No, I wouldn't say I was a, a huge racing film fan. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I, there are racing films I love, but I grew up in Indianapolis. So, and my, my grandparents lived in Speedway, Indiana. So, from, you know, I, I think I went to the Indianapolis 500 when I was maybe, first time when I was maybe nine or something like that, nine mm -hmm. or 10, and have been to that race so many times. I mean, it's just part of my growing up is trekking to that race every May and, you know, watching those cars and feeling the thump of those engines, mm -hmm. you know, in my chest. So, so to say that racing's in my blood is not true, right. but it's in my history. You know what I mean? And I yeah. think it's anybody who's from Indiana, which is where I'm from knows that come May, you are a racing fan. I mean, you can't escape it. You know, you That's are really just a big ticket item out there. So yeah. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, just the, the whole, the state shuts down for the month of May and yeah. everybody looks at that. So, you know, th this story kind of spoke to me because it sort of reminded me of growing up in Indiana, I think. Yeah, and you said Muncie area. Like Muncie slap shifters are made in Muncie, Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. What is? I, saw... I think Muncie like drag shifters, slap shifters. I oh. think those are made in Muncie, Indiana. Are they really? I, I believe so, yeah. At the... least at one time, you know? Yeah, that's funny. That's right. Those like three speed, those are like those the, the three speed. I think it's, they yeah. make all kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, Anything to right. get into gear quicker. Right, you know? right, right. Which is a good segue into the question I want to ask you. So Carol Shelby and all these guys, Edelbrock, all these guys that learned how to build faster race cars all come out of World War II and that kind of era. Yeah. And they just had this, this they just kept pushing cars and pushing cars and, and developing new things. And Carol Shelby is, like on our race team, we have a guy, Dave Montoya, and he's sort of, you know, he's sort of our Carol Shelby. He understands what the car needs to do. And if he says, we're going to race, then we're going to race. And if he's not bought into it, then we're not going to race. You mean if the car's ready? The car, yeah. Get yeah. the car ready. Like, it's always impossible. Everybody's right. got lives and kids and not enough money. And then at some point, he'll say, this is going to happen. And then we all can buy in on it. Carol Shelby is that guy in this story. And you know he's a force of nature. He's a great race car driver. He's a visionary. But most importantly, he's a leader. And he's just, he's from Texas. So he's just so fucking American. You nail it, right? I think at least you don't make him tropey and like you know. Oh, I'm really going to get the damn, damn it's going to happen, right? 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 But you, you come right up next to that point yeah. where like yeah. you really can believe in this guy and he's not he's not too much, right? Which anymore he would have been too much. Yeah, I think that's true, and I, I, that's a testament to Jim Mangold and Matt Damon. You know, I, I think if anything we pulled back on the real Carol Shelby for sure, for, right? I mean, you know, is. you know about it. He was this guy was. You know, he was a, you know, he, you know, he was an impresario. I mean, he, this guy was bigger than life. And um, I don't think you could have put that on film the way he really was. I don't right. think anybody would have believed it. You know, yeah. he was that, he was that kind of a character, you know? Yeah, fascinating guy. Just a fascinating guy. I mean, as a race car driver, you're, 
you, you've grown up with Carroll Shelby. As, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, he, he was so viable when Ford was done with him. Lee Iacocca is like, well, come on over to Dodge <laughs> right. and put turbos in Dodge Omnis. Right. right. We're going to call that the GLHS goes like hell. Some more. <laughs> That's an actual thing. Is that right? I swear to God, that's true. A Dodge Omni with extra turbos on it. <laughs> that's an Iacocca special? Uh, yeah. He, he dreamed yeah. that up? And yeah, him <laughs> and Carol Shelby. Another, another car not accused of winning any beauty contest. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right. But there is a lot of that American, you know, super powered, I'll be damned. I mean, look, they take on, yeah. they take on Ferrari. And, and they have no business winning within a year or two of when they yeah. start this project, but they do. You know, at stake, you know, it was a grudge match between, you know, Henry Ford II and Enzo Ferrari, but at stake, it became so much more. It was nationalism. You know, it was, you know, it was really a moment before globalism started to sort of take over. I mean, this is, this is yeah. you know, Henry Ford II's opportunity to sort of expand into Europe you know, and, and there was just an American spirit behind this story and this moment that was undeniable. And, and I mean, hopefully that comes out in the movie. It certainly was um, a point of inspiration for me in sort of digging deeper into the story. It's just how quintessentially American, you know, the story was. It was. And you said, you alluded earlier, 10 years into the project. So when did you first sink your teeth into this story and then talk? a little bit about that that process and the research that goes into this yeah. because when people sit down and watch 90 minutes on the big screen right they see 90 minutes they don't see 10 yeah. years if that's what it was so what was your you know i was fox approached me you know almost 10 years ago um with this story i, I didn't know about the story i i'd known about carol shelby i'd known about a few of these racers you know that i mm -hmm. you know became more acquainted with as i researched the project but um, I didn't know about this particular story. Ten years ago, Fox said, look, we think there's a movie here. And I started writing. And it was a tricky one, right? Because the story is so much bigger than the 90 minutes you see. And it's, and it's so much bigger even than Shelby and Ken Miles. I mean, it, you know, it involves, you know, the Ferrari side was every bit as compelling, in my view, um, as what was happening on the American side. I mean... So as I dug deeper into this idea of, look, there was a real battle in 64, 65, and 66 to win Le Mans, I started to uncover all these incredible characters and stories on mm. both sides of the Atlantic. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, on the Ferrari side, there was, you know, Phil Hill, who's one of the great race car drivers in history, who was racing for Ferrari at the time. There was John Surtees, who was the great English motorcycle racer who became a Ferrari team member who was one of the greats of all time. They were happening at the same time that Shelby and Miles and, you know, Phil Remington and these guys were trying to build this Ford team. You know, there was this equally incredible drama that was unfolding on the other side of the Atlantic. And so, you know, talking about process, the, the difficult thing for me was, what story do I tell? You know, there's yeah. so many incredible characters here. And what do I, it wasn't immediately apparent that this was a Carol Shelby, Ken Miles yeah, not story. Yeah, not just whose story, but what story, because you've got the business, you've got the racing, you've got the drama, the oh, personal God. struggle, competition. It, yeah. It was, I mean, it's a good problem to have, yeah. right? As you're a writer, Definitely. it's like you, you want to have too much story to tell. But that's what I found in those early years. You know, I think my first draft that I turned into the studio was, you know, 200 plus pages long. Wow. I Maybe mean, it was like 220 pages What's long. What's the, the norm is what, 120? Is it, or yeah, like one. one Hilliard will tell you. Yeah. It's like one. Yeah, you want, you know, the, yeah. probably the less better. A studio executive doesn't want to get a 220 page script on their desk. You know what I mean? They kind of go, uh oh. Yeah. What's happening, you know? And you have a lot of... So the character of Car Carol Shelby's bigger than the screen already. And yeah. then Ken Miles is incredible. But by the yeah. way, this international team, and you got this absolute force of nature and this absolute genius at driving and building yes. and understanding yeah. cars. Oh, and by the way, McLaren. Oh, and by the way, Phil Hill. And all yeah. these other people that are racing legends. I mean, yeah. McLarens have a name for a reason. You yeah, know? right. It's actually actually yeah. a person yeah. attached to that. Yeah. How do you how do you gracefully 
include those guys who deserve a story into this. You know, I mean, Enzo Ferrari is in it, but you know, only barely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was, uh, that was hard. I mean, it was hard for all of us. And I, you know, I include, you know, my co-writers in that and Jim Mangold in that and the studio. I mean, it was, it was, it was difficult to, you know, sort of zero in on exactly the line we wanted to, you know, explore. We always knew that Ken Miles was the most fascinating character of all of them. I, I felt so, you know, I, mm-hmm. I didn't know who Ken Miles was before I started looking into this hmm. story, right? And although he's well known in racing stories, I don't know if you pro- knew of him. I knew but, of him, but you not knew like of what him. he had done, yeah. I didn't. So, so as I'm sort of, you know, doing this research and uncovering this, I felt like I was, uh, you know, discovering Mozart for the first time, hmm. right? Of course I wasn't, right? Right, And people know of this guy yeah. and he's well regarded as one of the greats of all time. But here I was discovering this 45 year old virtuoso behind the wheel of a car who was destined for uh, obscurity. I mean, this guy yeah. was not, until this story grabbed him, right? Until Carol Shelby tapped him on the shoulder and said, I need your help. He was going to die in North Hollywood. Yeah. A, a, in complete obscurity. So here I was kind of, you know, digging into this and there's very, there was very little written about him. I mean, very few people sort of, you know, um, have researched him and, but I started to hear about this guy and look into him and I, I was just captivated by him. So I, I always knew that he was, you know, at the center of the story mm. in some way, but it became really difficult, right? Because you have Bruce McLaren, who's there, who's really reduced to very little in the movie, right? Right. But here's one of the great <laughs> race car drivers of all time, yeah. you know, and there's just, the list goes on and on and on with the story. And that's, you know, you ask sort of the development process. Yeah. That was what was tricky. I, it was hard for me as the first writer on this for years to, you know, to jettison characters and storylines because as i got deeper into it I, like you i just had such profound respect yeah. for these names that i was becoming familiar with and what they had accomplished it, w- it became really fucking hard yeah you know? i find you become a disciple of different cultures and communities that you know nothing about right. and then you jump into the water like nascar or racing yeah. or religion or whatever whatever it is you just get immersed into is a which starts as kind of a cool idea and then it, develops into a research project, then you're like, oh, I gotta tell that story. And like, there's so many stories yeah. you wanna tell. And like, yeah, I'd like to tell McLaren's story. Yeah, I'd like to tell Shelby's yeah. story. But you have to tell a snapshot in time and keep it to that and know that that's gonna satisfy people, I think is a challenge. And the creative process is cool too, but we were talking about before we started recording today is some of the challenges that come along with that from guys who are Big in the industry, I think, seem pretty protected with what they write in their content. You had people telling me you had some some speed bumps. There's another pun, man. There's a Gee, ton of them. You can't, you can't, you can't help it yourself. Just, just happens. Oh I can't even have myself. Like... <laughs> uh, a couple of speed bumps with with the with the writing and and the credits and all that. And I, I'd like to hear that that side of the story because for people who want to be writers. Uh, or screenwriters especially is you've got intellectual property you've got ideas and you write them down and you always think that people are trusting yeah. in this industry and you know newsflash one-on-one it, it, it's not the case all the time and it, you yeah. just got to be you have to be careful and you have to also surround yourself with great people um so yeah. how was that for you well you know specifically i i think i mean we could talk about ford versus ferrari but sure. you know specifically yeah. but but also i think generally you know Feature writers in this town are treated very differently. You know, I, it, it, I have found that um, we're we're not we're not invited to interact with one another in a <laughs> in a sort of supportive way. Hilliard's laughing back it's there. Weird. Yeah, yeah. Hillary, Hillary, and I we want to we we actually want to fight right now because he's a fellow. Fan. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> no, he's coming uh, in. Hillary, he's coming you. in. I know yeah. you're coming. <laughs> Listen, we even had the, the interloper was set up for Hilliard you. guests, and uh, we're in his <laughs> office here on the lot in Formosa. You, you just couldn't put on like a brick yeah, laugh. So. You couldn't help Which yourself. Great. Maybe angle. You guys are having too much fun. Go ahead. But you know we. And chime in and let me know if you, if you feel this way too. I, I've found that feature writers in this town are, we're, we're separated, right? We, we are, 
you know, I think the town believes that we can't get along or we're very, you know, we're temperamental. And, you know, if Hilliard comes in after me as a writer, I'm going to be angry at him or we're not going to be able to kind of talk about a project. It's this very bizarre um, sort of sense of feature writers and, you know, not not wanting to get along and, and work together. And and I think... It's more isolated, though, than television. Very That's why. It's very isolating. I was just going to say, um, it, it reminds me, the reason why I went to jump it because I, yeah. I get excited about this. And here's why. So I interview a lot of the A-list writers at the Writers Guild, you know, for their screenings and stuff. Like, I was going to do yours, actually. Mm-hmm. And then something came up. Yeah. But, um, so, so what I found is sometimes when I interview... Um, writers when there's a first writer and there's a second writer, third writer, whatever, and they've actually never met each other until we oh actually do the screening. And I'm responsible for talking to them, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. bringing them together and they're looking at each other like, I, I don't even know what he f- freaking wrote. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like they, I, yeah. I've, I've been in situations where it's actually uncomfortable. Oh, wow. Literally. Yeah. And so what I found and I noticed like whenever I do a writing assignment for anybody, the first thing I do, this is my question for you, is I call them. Mm-hmm. Even if they don't, no. Right. I just reach out to them and go, hey, mm-hmm. so letting you know I'm taking over, you know, so that there's no weird – the town is too small. It's too small. You know what yeah, I mean? So what's, what's your thought on that? I think it's a great practice. I know you practice. can't always do it, though. But. You, you can't always do it, but I think it's a great practice. And and I even, I even think it's what is best for the project, you know. And I tried to do this last year on a thing right. where – I was approached by a studio to jump in on a project that had already had a couple writers come in mm-hmm. on it. And two of the three writers that were ahead of me, I knew. Mm-hmm. And the last writer ahead of me, I knew really well. Very okay. talented guy. Mm-hmm. And a, you know, a friend of mine indirectly. I mean, we weren't close friends, but I knew him and we, we'd spoken okay. many times. And I went to the studio and I said, look, I have ideas for how to improve this project. I don't think I have all the answers. Okay why don't you let me call the previous writer? I know him. And let's, why don't you let us talk? Because he maybe had, that's had some, really nice of you. Well, of course. That's but, really nice of you. People don't do it. That's what I'm saying. People don't go do ahead, it. Go ahead. They don't do it. But, yeah. but here's the thing. It only serves me, yes. right? And it serves the project mm-hmm. in a better way. And, and I ended up doing it, right? Um, and it was helpful. But typically a studio will say no. Don't you know? What, do you you know? We've already been down the road with that writer, or you know, some you know, whatever happened. It's a very, you know, it's a, it, you know, I I don't think this town utilizes feature writers as effectively as they could. Okay. Um, I don't know what the fix is, but but you know, if you and I are trying to solve a problem, you know, I think that you and I probably have a better chance at solving the problem as two probably writers true. than just me. But you do TV in, too, right? I've just started doing TV. Okay, but yeah, it seems sometimes you have a mindset that's a little bit more uh, what inclusive. They call it. And yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I think that the thought is, maybe it is the old school way, and I'm going to jump over and no, over this no, whole thing. This I apologize. Is... I got my man on the show. I got to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I do find it fascinating to me that that I think that the industry it has been taught that. You know, we're already the first people to go. Like, the, you're not even hardly invited on the set. You're not invited no. to the screening, Jimmy. There's like so many different things, you know. So, I mean, it's crazy in, in, in film. They have no respect for the writers whatsoever. I, I can go on and on. I think, I think the exactly. irony, too, is there would be no project without somebody taking that and actually putting their fingers on that keyboard and writing something down right. to even deviate from. And uh, yeah. to get back to the question, too, which is great, is. Isn't it really at the end of the day about the credits that you're competing for? I don't know if it's about the the lion's share of the pie when it comes to cash in the industry, yeah. but the credit and where the writer gets his name on the screen is kind of what I was was digging in. Where where you were in a battle about credit? Who's mm-hmm. getting credit for Ford versus Ferrari? Well, especially on yours, like you see the N and the and the ampersand yeah. and the whatever, it gets crazy. I mean, we didn't, you know. Part of your question, I think, is arbitration. You right. know, mm-hmm. we didn't arbitrate Ford versus Ferrari. We that didn't go to arbitration. The writers and we, the other writers, two brothers, very talented guys, Jez and John Henry Butterworth. We agreed to share credit because we didn't want to go through an arbitration process. Right. I have been through many arbitration processes. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. it, you always bleed. Even if you win, it is a bloody exercise, yeah. and it is, and it's unruly, and it's and it's. It's imperfect. I don't, you know, it's the best it can be, I think. 
but you know that that process it is about credit you know it is about you know if you're if you're in an if you've spent 8 months of your life you know rewriting a script and you feel like you deserve credit on it you know you need to fight for credit and i mean it's, this is it's a tu- it's a tough i'd like to hear your guys thoughts on this too because this is really tough as we're we're talking about writing is you create a, you create this product, um, whether it's screenplay, short story, and you have that idea in it, and you, you, I, at least for me, it was guarding it and soccer momming it to the point where oh, I don't want to share it with Hilliard because he might steal that idea or this, and and even with my first book uh, that came out, I've been immersed in that is through the, the legal process and and having to deal with unscrupulous people and <laughs> you're right i won but i still had to cough <laughs> yeah, yeah. up thousands of bucks to pay my attorney and right. you know that cuts into your profits and it's a it's an ugly side of the business so now yeah. as i move forward as you know helping other veteran authors at least in my space is uh or anybody is get it in writing so no one's feelings get hurt at the end of the day and i i, yeah. I, I say that to protect myself and protect everybody and i think that that is something that a lot of people get into the business they don't think about this either the well, business well there's mm-hmm. a lot of simple things i don't mean to please jump in there's a lot of simple things you can do like um i come from the indie world right and now i'm doing much bigger stuff but even in that world say i'd meet a producer here right and they're like hey you know we heard you're a writer blah 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 love for you to write this thing and we'd have a great conversation They find out what my quote is or whatever. And I'm like, it's this, blah, blah, blah. And then I send them an email that night going, hey, here's what we talked about. Right? It's like a reminder. And that is also your stamp. And I always say, if you agree, say yes or whatever the fuck. (laughs) You know what I mean? And then they say yes. And then I can go on to my lawyers and my agents and everybody else and move on from there. But at least I started the process legit. You know what I mean? Going, here's the project I have. We had this conversation. Here's all the things we talked about. And, you know, over, over time, you start to understand what the contracts are in general. You can kind of do it yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you start to figure that out. So I know what to ask for. I know what to. And then they just have to kind of really negotiate. But I just put the basic terms in there. You know? If that paper trails sense. are always great. Right. <laughs> it's always good to have a paper Email trail. is all I'm saying. You yeah. can do it in email. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that's right. What's the, I, I'm sure, like, many Pete gets hit up for, by people he was just talking about it. He said, hey, I'm going to Palm Springs. This guy wants me to help him out with the podcast, mm-hmm. and I want to start this. I'm sure you guys get inundated with people sending you emails and saying, oh, yeah, I want to write a screenplay. What's your threshold from some friendly advice to, well, this isn't a hobby for me. Um, if I'm going to give you notes or I'm going to give you – I'm like going to expect credit. Well, I, I mean, it's a good question. You know, the, I, I love writers. I'm supportive of writers. I love talking to writers. I, you know, I love the creative process. I love talking to authors, painters. I just, I love, I love those kind of people. I love, you know, anybody who's sort of willing to kind of be vulnerable and, and, and put it down on paper or on a can. I just, I just love that. Right. If you're talking about somebody who's sending me a script and it, it, it occasionally happens. I mean, to your point, Hilliard, it's like you. Do, I do have to be careful about what I'm. Now, if, if this is a close friend, it doesn't. It doesn't count, sure. right? But you know, if somebody I meet, and I, it, you know, a couple times a year, somebody might do this. They might get my email and send me something just, you know, in my inbox. I, I am very careful about not reading that or calling them and sort of having a right. talk with them about it because it's just, you know. To your point, you just want to, and your point, you know, you just want to be very clear about what you're getting into, and you know, it's very. You have to be. And they very assume careful about once that. they sent it to you that you did look at it. They yeah, assume right. it. Yeah, it's <laughs> you true. know what I mean. It's I true. get about a hundred of them a day from my company. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it's and true. And they just assume that you read it. So I have to yeah. say, we do not solicit. You know, yeah. they said, Baba, you have to make sure you say it. You know what I mean? But every blue moon, you'll read something. You'll be like, actually, that's a good log line. That's pretty good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, I yeah. also love when people, I, I like it when people come up and say, I, I have this idea for a movie. It might not be a great idea, but every, you know, occasionally it's like, that's a really great idea right. yeah. for a world, right. you know? And if it is, you know, I'll, I'll, um, you know, I'll talk to them further about it and see if something happens with it. But, you know, you never know where the great idea is going to come from. Yeah, what a great chat, by the way. And I knew I told you guys that Hilliard would not be able to sit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say this, though. Check this out. Backing up on what you were talking about, about I think that newer writers, I'm sure you agree, mm. 
newer writers have this thing that, you know, we don't want anybody to see it or whatever. Whereas all of us who've been writing for years are like, read it. I don't care. I'm not, you know, I'm like yeah. not worried about yeah. it at all. Yeah. No matter who gets it, no matter, even if I didn't register it yet, I'm, I'm just not even concerned because it's all about execution. Yeah. You know what I mean? The way he's an amazing writer. I read the script. It's amazing. But I'm like that. I like to know what's going on and who, how did you do the action? How did you describe the driving scenes? Blah, blah. And so for me, his execution is different than mine, right? I might take some stuff from his because like the way he, you know, does this little cool move or the way that, they, that he describes this or he does that. And, and, but the way that we might open this script may be different. The, you know, the way we might introduce the characters, the movement, the transitions, all these things are different. So for me, you can take my idea, you won't be able to execute it the way that I can. And that's why I don't worry about it. And a lot of my other friends, you probably feel the same way. You just don't, I'm not worried about you. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. And where I got that from, and I think you've heard me talk about this, mm -hmm. Pete. Um, before I ever had an office, I used to be at the coffee shops in West Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, at the gay freaking Mecca here yeah. in West Hollywood. I used to sit across from Lance Black when he was writing Milk. And this is something he says to everybody, so it's not just my story. But he talks about, I used to always ask him, where were you? And he's like, oh, I was in San Francisco, you know, working on this, you know, research in Milk. I'm like, isn't there like three other movies on Milk? And he's right. like, yeah, but nobody's going to do it like me. Right. Like he was so confident. Hmm. And it reminded me of what I'm talking about, about yeah. never being worried about what everybody else is doing. Do your shit. Such good. Yeah, and he said, you got to be first. He's yeah. like, I'm going to yeah. be first. Right. And he was. Well, that is so important. Right. You got to right. be first. Right. Yeah. But no, I think that's great advice. It's like, you know, you want to, you know, it's such age old advice, but it's, it's what, what is pulling you to write that particular let me ask story. You, let me ask you this right then, too, is you know, when we're talking about Ford versus Ferrari, this thing in, in the industry about doing market research before you laid your hands on the keyboard and started doing the research and all this, did you, was there a component saying, well, what other movies had been made about racing? No. So you did not repeat that or you just know when it's coming out of you, like Hilliard was just saying, like it's going to be through a completely different lens. Every, everything. I, you know, I didn't say he didn't do research. Or, or you hit, oh, I did tons of research. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, I mean, or you hit, say, you hit, say, you go, shit, that's Days of Thunder I just wrote. Like, no, you know, no, no, no. I, I never did that. Um, I, I didn't stack it up again. I didn't look at the box office of other, you know, racing right. movies or, and honestly, I, I didn't even think about how difficult it would have been to get made. You know, I was just so fucking moved by the characters. Mm. Yeah. That was it. It was sort of like, at a certain level, mm. I'm happy the movie got made. You know what I mean, and and I'm happy that everybody is able to share in this story. I mean, that's I'm, I'm you know that's a that's a wonderful outcome. I didn't give a fuck mm. ten years ago. I you know when I started to sort of read about these characters and hear about the story, you know, like I was saying, I felt like I was discovering this for the first time. You know, Ken Miles. Like, I was just so into these guys in this world that. I just wanted to write about it and I wanted to write a screenplay and I disappeared into this thing for a long, long time and I was happy, right? I, I, I think as a screenwriter, especially nowadays, I mean, you know, it's gotten tighter, but it's like, if you're writing because you want to see your movie made, that's a scary fucking prospect, yeah. right? I happen to, when I find a story that moves me and I feel like I'm connected to it, I love fucking writing, you know? And, and, in many ways, I'm... And it shows on the page to me. Oh, thank you. For sure. I and and, and, and to, to piggyback off of that, and you've heard me say this. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Oh, thank you. For sure. And, 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 and to, to piggyback off of that, and you've heard me say this, I've interviewed on my podcast and other podcasts, the Writers Guild podcast, over 300 different people. And every single person who finally got to their big break yeah. was with a story that everybody told them not to write. <laughs> That's so every true. Yeah. Yeah, and it's usually like that yeah. script that took them 10 years to yeah. write or whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? Sure. Oh, it's so true. I, you know, I... I but talk about talk about that. That's a good. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Go no, ahead. No. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I I was a working writer for a decade right. before I I had something made. So for ten years, I'm out there 
writing screenplays, yeah. selling, you know, stories, like hustling, you know, as a working writer. I mean, that was my, that was my job for 10 years. At a certain point, I don't know when it was, I didn't think I would ever get a fucking movie made. And there, most of the writers are like that. Everybody's yeah. selling yeah. stuff and nobody's getting produced. It's nobody's crazy. getting produced, right? right? And so, so actually the screenplay became the end all for me, right? I started to, you know, read writers that I admired, right. you know, Stephen Zalian, Eric Roth, these right. guys. I started, you know, that was my film school. I didn't right. go to film school. I would re I'd go down to Book City Collectibles yeah. on Hollywood Boulevard. They used yeah. to have, you could buy, they had a back room that was about the size of this office right. and it was filled with, you know, uh, screenplays with three brads mm -hmm. in it, right? And for twelve dollars, you could buy a screenplay. Yeah. And this was back when maybe you pre remember. <laughs> this is pre. No, this is way pre-internet, okay, yeah, right? So good. actually, reading the script for The Godfather yes. was a. On oh paper. my god, he got. Oh no, I, I heard Steve has a copy of The Godfather. Really? Oh, I got to borrow it. Right. You know, I mean, it was right. it was it was kind of difficult in that way. But I remember reading, you know, the writers I admired, and and that became the sort of end point for me because I was like I'm never going to get a movie made mm. it's 10 years I, you know I've tried I've, I've written a lot of good stuff you know I, you know I'm making a living as a writing but I don't think I'm ever going to get a, a, a movie made and so the screen you know writing it researching it getting into it putting it on the page and having it read as beautifully as I could make it mm -hmm. became the sort of the 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 end all for me and I, I think that's still and that's exactly operate, what I preach you know. to writers today. You only win in your writing. You know, it's the only thing you control. It's the only thing that it's your it's your um, calling card. It's it's everything. And it's the, the one thing that brings you out of being the comedy guy who's not writing drama, being the horror guy who's not writing comedy. Whatever it is that you do, the writing always wins. To so that, I, I think it's interesting to to dig into your office, uh, your desk drawers, and and again. Much like the analogy, you see 90 minutes on the screen, but you don't see the 10 years that went into that. Right. For every one that lands on the screen, I think there's so many great stories. You're like, well, I'm just going to tell a story and whether it gets made, it doesn't. I mean, no. the volumes and stacks of articles or short stories or screenplays that you guys have sitting around, it's got to be vast at this stage like of the game. Thousands of scripts. Yeah. Like for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It goes back to your point of execution. You know, it, you, you got to pull it off or a writer has to pull it off. So it reads a certain way on, on the page and in the screenplay and, form. And you know. don't, and I just have to say this in, 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 a, in a huge, you know, congratulations to you. You don't get Matt Damon and Kristen Bale in your movie if the script is not killing the page. I'm telling you. The boys know that's, how to read a script. That's nice of you And they say, know yeah. what they're looking for. Yeah. And, there, and there are so many moments. And one of the things I love about the, the, the film and the script itself is... Every single one of your main characters all had big moments, like several. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm always preaching. You've heard me say, mm -hmm. you yep. gotta have, they got to have moments. Because mm -hmm. one of my, my, my producing partner is a huge casting director. <clears throat> and she can get to anybody. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've learned that's elevated all my scripts is finding those moments. Like mm -hmm. the moment where um, um, Christian's, forgive me, I don't know the character's name. Christian's wife is driving the car and she does that whole, right, yeah, yeah. it's a moment I'm right. on the, on the screen. She's like, I'm doing a role for that scene. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so like my producing partner, like when she gets on the phone with these actors or with their agents, she doesn't talk about the script. Yeah. She talks about these scenes that they've never done before. Right. <laughs> you know that's what I mean? Great. So yeah. that's what I'm looking for. And I, there must've been 10 of them. I was like, <laughs> there are some amazing scenes in here. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And you know, I have to also credit my co-writers. I mean, okay. the Butterworths did a great job and Jim Mengel. I mean, you're talking about an Oscar nominated writer right. who's directing the movie that you've been working on. It's right. pretty great. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, there's just, there, there was a lot of talent. And, and I, I think that, you know, that is one thing that, Jim Mangold is great at doing is finding those human moments in these characters that are, you know, almost that are iconic, that are almost sort of calcified in our sort of minds, right? Whether it's Johnny Cash, you mm -hmm. know, or any of these, mm -hmm. he, that guy has the ability to sort of dig down into mm -hmm. a character, both in the way he writes and the way he directs, you know, and find those moments that you're talking about that feel real, that are, that grab you by the throat, um, you know. Or put you in the car. Or put you in the car. I mean, that was, yeah, that was, it was a good scene. Yeah. That yeah. wrench that's in the movie, the actual wrench that yeah. Ken Miles hucks at yeah. Carol Shelby, does yeah. that really happen? 
And then when did that become, and was that your, yeah. your idea to talk about that a little bit? That, well, that Ken miles was a live wire, mm-hmm. right? And, and that, you know, he was actually that, that the wrench scene was a, was a, you know, not, I wouldn't say fabricated because there are lots of stories of Ken miles having punched guys in the face, yeah. you know, thrown, <laughs> you know, all sorts of things. I mean, he was known as this kind of guy. I think we even pulled it back on him, really. Mm. I mean, this guy was known for if an owner of a car disagreed with the way he set up the car, he would drill him in the face, (laughs) right? I mean, this is is why at 45 years old, Ken Miles, who was the best of the best, I mean, this is, you know, even drivers and mechanics of that era at the time who were, you know, if you were to have interviewed Bruce McLaren in 1963, who's the best of the best? He would have said Ken Miles, right? somebody you don't even know. Ken Miles. Tell everybody what Ken Miles did in World War II. He was a tank commander. So, you know, like, <laughs> it's the tolerance level for bullshit is zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> zero. Like, you're not a Nazi, so guess what's going to happen? You're going to get punched in the fucking mouth. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you're talking about a guy who was a tank commander in World War II, who was, who was one of the first guys, his, his um, battalion, um, I think, liberated... Auschwitz first. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I, well, I, maybe it wasn't Auschwitz, but I mean, imagine with this guy, exactly right. The bullshit that yeah. this guy would put up would be zero. Zero. Right? Yeah. And he was, he operated at a level that nobody understood. I mean, there are so many stories about Ken Miles that, you know, Bruce McLaren, any one of these guys would take a car out and that car would have a top speed, what, whatever. That car would have a lap, top lap time of, a minute and 37 seconds, right? right? Everybody would just say, you can't beat minute 37. Ken Miles would take it out and do 132. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knew how he did it. I mean, they talked about him having a near mystical connection hmm. with the machinery, right? He was able to just coax out. I mean, you're a race car driver. Yeah. You know what it is to drive a car to the limit, right? Yeah. That's, when, that's when adhesion to the track ceases to exist, yeah. you know? This guy was able to go right there, and then that half inch passed. Yeah. It, you know, and it, but as talented as he was, he was a fucking asshole by all accounts. I mean, he just really was can I, insane. Can I know? just back up on something yeah. you were talking about earlier? About you were talking about the wrench, right? So, Pete, the wrench, whether it happened in the scene or not, mm-hmm. is actually when you're writing a bio historic movie about something that really happened, you still have to have license to, yeah. to make it a movie because what happens in real life isn't always that interesting, right? So that sounds like one of those classic scenes. For example, I had a writer here the other day come and pitch me this project. She was talking about this scene and I said, I said, oh, it's interesting. You have that one scene where the two girls are sitting there and they're having this conversation about the father. I said, but it's not dramatic enough because the father's actually not, they don't realize the father's actually standing behind them <laughs> listening right. to the conversation. And she went, oh, well, it really happened. He wasn't there. I said, that's the problem. Right. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're not, you're not yeah. thinking yeah. cinematically. You're thinking what really happened in life. And most younger writers write that first script and they don't, they don't know how to pull it out of them, make it like you write your book. You can't just describe it exactly. You have to turn up some of the, the energy yeah. and the action and, you know what I mean, to, to make people go, ooh, real life is long and boring, yeah. Yeah. so yes, one wrench equals 100 asshole moments. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. But you, you <laughs> talked about it. It's like when you, when you start, if, if we're talking about true stories, when you start to step into these true stories and you start to, you know, become sort of full of what's happening in this whatever world you're uncovering, and you start to meet these characters, you do start to feel like you have to honor them yeah. in a way, right? The, the stakes sure. become really high. So it does become, you're absolutely right. It's like you, you have to take license and make, you know, something cinematic if, if in real, but then you also battle this other thing where mm. you're kind of going, Oh, you know, I, I want to be, I want to tell this story in a, you know, in the, in a true way. I want to be honest about this because I'm dealing with, Ken Miles, or yeah, I'm it's dealing, a big it figure that everybody knows about. It's difficult. Sometimes. But, the, it's but tricky, the mechanics you know? and the guy putting air in the tires and the parts guy, they've probably got their own stories that are equally as fascinating that yeah. bring everything to fruition. But you, to, I mean, no, I, there's, it's going to be hard to sell a movie about the guy that put the tires on the car or even feature, like they're yeah. in there, yeah. but you have to, 
you do have to have those emblematic moments. I think that's pretty difficult when you've got so many people in your story that are so yeah. fascinating yeah. that you run into along the way. Well, I failed. I mean, in that I, my first draft was 220 pages long. <laughs> I, I was a, you know, this is a total. I, might, I remember my total. agent was like, he got it, you know, when I sent it into the student, and he, and he called me right away. And he was just like, <laughs> but I mean, what it? the fuck? You, don't, you <laughs> can't do this, man. I was like, I know, but dude, just read it. You know, it was, it, you know, I, it was, I, I lost my mind for but a moment. But it is a really hard pairing process because, first off, you don't get to build a Le Mans car unless you're the best car builder in the world, you yeah, know? Right. Whether it's Ferrari, Ford, or anybody yeah. else. You don't get to drive that car <laughs> unless you're the best fucking driver they can find yeah. at that specific thing, which means there's there's 25 guys on that entire yeah. grid that are at that level and everybody yeah. else is secondary. So you have all these incredible people. By the way, three cars from Ferrari, three cars from Ford. I mean, all these people... They're all the best at what they do. The best at what they do. Yeah. And the then there's Ford, the guy himself. There's yeah, Ferrari, yeah. the guy himself. Yeah. And all of these yeah. egos you have to manage. But, 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 but then the, and the real antagonist is the track. Yes. This is, you know, you can, you, oh, can have, love it. you can have, you know, personalities clashing and you can have, you know, Henry Ford II and People Leo. Cheating. You can have like, <laughs> but the real antagonist in this movie always was, for me, was always the fucking track. I always yeah. thought of it as mm. eight and a half miles of just, you know, fucking <laughs> dra a dragon that yeah. everyone was trying to, you know, slay. Um, so that's the, you know, that. Yeah. And, you know and what I kept thinking when I was watching the movie? Hmm. I was sitting there with my husband, I was like, so they're in these cars for all this time. Is there no music playing? Is there no? <laughs> That's a long fucking time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, Maybe now. now. Maybe now. I know. Exactly. I know. Well, the That's cars hilarious. don't break down now. Okay. They can run easily for 24 hours okay. at top speed. You know. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I was thinking, I guess you got to, you probably need to hear the sounds too. Yeah, though, you're right? talking to right. the car all the time. Like you're yeah. listening for the yeah. tires, like in squeaking versus screeching. You know, like there's a difference, right? And then, yeah, you're, you're listening to like how everything Thing works and if you hear sounds now like in our car it's modern times we can communicate back with the pit and say there's something happening and then we can sort of sort it out right but back then it was all on the driver and if you come in and it's something that you don't need to come in for that's a lap right and you can't give away laps yeah so it's it is a really that's why there's just no time for music or anything like that you're trying to you're trying to squeeze every ounce of speed out that you can and efficiency so it's really to be able to do what ken did and to know the car that, like Nicky Lauda from uh, the Formula One, same thing, where he had the ability to drive at the elite level, but also engineer at the highest level. And that's why he was successful. Yeah. Yeah. I guess he's, a, and I want to jump in on you yeah. too. That's a good point too, is the, uh, the safety difference between oh. 65 to 75 or 65. I mean, 10 years before this movie's made, you know, Jim, James Dean is dying on a right. interchange just right. a little bit north of here in a car with no fucking seatbelts. Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, that's the way, what, you know, that was the other thing that grabbed me about this era of yeah. racing, which I knew very little about, that up until really, well, in many ways, Ken Miles' death was, was instrumental in sort of people talking, you know, the, the, the industry talking about safety, you know, it wasn't until 67, 68, really Ralph Nader, mm -hmm. before people started to really understand that 20, the, the number, the different numbers, but 25% of professional drivers died every season. Wow, 25%? 25%. So you're talking about one in four drivers that started a Grand Prix season, right, died by the end of the season. Wow. You know, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, mid 60s, you, you know mm -hmm. the statistic. Yeah, for sure. There, it wouldn't be unheard of. As a matter of fact, it would be a shock if you went to a Formula One race mm -hmm. and you didn't see a driver die. Really? This is what happened yeah. back then. I mean, you're talking about no seat belts. You're talking about car designers and manufacturers who didn't give a shit about the drivers. Mm -hmm. They were looking for what you're talking about. Comp total efficiency, yeah. speed. They didn't think about you know, impact, you know, uh, zones and ratios and all they, they didn't care about that. Enzo was the worst, by the way, I right? Bet. He was, he, he, you know, in his view, you know, drivers were, were, were just puppets that he sort of put in his beautiful cars. I mean, he, yeah. he thought of his cars as alive, his drivers as just replaceable, you know, replaceable. Yeah. But 
Yeah, there was no, you know, not even roll cages for a long time. Not even roll cages. <laughs> well, it's funny. Well, it's, I, I, I was thinking about that because in the opening, Matt is driving a that Porsche. Yeah, but even all the other, they, none of them have a, a top on them. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, everybody has a tops on them. It seemed yeah. most of them. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, do they're driving that fast with no tops? No even belts oh, yeah. in the Grand Prix thing. start, we have your hand on the wall, and then you run to your car. And they're like, you know what? Fuck that stupid idea. Like. <laughs> Like that moment of racing to no 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 let's get these guys fastened in with helmets real helmets designed for actual racing yeah. not just like something so is that gone they don't do that anymore? they don't do that no they anymore. Don't. no no, no. Okay. it's just it's not worth it like right. what difference does it make in a twenty four hour race if you get to your car a tenth of a second faster than the next guy yeah. you know. It's, it's, such a, it's such a French th- idea. Yeah. It's this incredible little flurry in the beginning of a race. Like, let's have these guys They're run across. Run the bull ride. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, safety. I mean, that was, the, you know, that uh, auto racing, you yeah. know, prior to 1967, 68 or so, it was, it was gladiatorial. Yeah. These guys, ev- and, and I think that was the thing that always fascinated me. I, I, I don't know about you guys, um, I don't put my life in jeopardy often. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a writer, you know, I live in Los Angeles, but these guys, I'm, you know, there are people, you know, firemen do that every day in this town and policemen, you know, this, this happens military, but these guys chose to get behind the wheel of these death machines at a moment when the technology far outpaced right. safety ideas. I mean, these cars were going 160, 70, 80, 190 miles an hour. And, if they crashed, they would just incinerate. I mean, there's just no chance. They did it over and over and over again. Because yeah, they kept they kept making them lighter and lighter and lighter, so yeah, they were just yeah. that's right. Of, that's right. Yeah, yeah they, and they take a lot of the structural metal out of it to make it lighter. Like you don't need that. You don't need that. Yeah. As long as you don't hit anything, you're great. <laughs> you but know, what drives a guy to do that? I mean, that was always fascinating right. to me. It's like what, it's what? in their blood. Yeah, those guys that I think do it's that. In any community, it, yeah, it, you use you can use so many great analogies, but. You talk about how small this town is just mm-hmm. with writers or in any population, producers, directors, right. actors, pretty small communities in the racing industry. What's your career path to get into that? Most people right. on the outside into the public think, oh, I could never be a, a NASCAR driver. I, mean, it's the same I could never thing do with, this. With but there is a path. But that population, I think, of drivers yeah. in each, you know, Le Mans, Formula One, Top Fuel, whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's But they're, such... still, they're all rock stars, and everybody yeah. wants to be one, though. So there's yeah, and they're still... so small. Yeah. It's yeah. just like writing, though, for you guys. Mm-hmm. Who in their fucking right mind would come here and go, I'm going to make movies happen? You know, no unless, kidding, you're really, man, I don't know. unless you're really entrenched <laughs> in the community, you don't know who any of those people are. I mean, the, the circles that I'm fortunate to roll in with, people yeah. go up to interview friends of mine who... Like let's just use Tito Ortiz, you yeah. know, the mm. top well, ranked MMA Tito fighter. Immediately, yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, sure. I I've like, been to his house. Like yeah. I, he's a great supporter of everything we do and veterans. And but if you want to sit around and talk fighting in UFC and sort of dropping names, I'd be like, yeah, I have no idea who that guy is. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no idea. Yeah. But I don't like bone up like oh great fighters yeah, and then I roll into Tito's house for his birthday where I'm like hey Tito so what do you think of that because I look right. like an amateur yeah, <laughs> right right yeah, right definitely. right yeah. that's a good point yeah good yeah. Point. yeah but again that's the thing, same thing too like you want to get into UFC fighting or some kind of freestyle of fighting if you knew what it took to get there to the very top and the chances yeah. that you're not going to ever make it yeah. you're just going to get your face kicked in for five yeah. years yeah you'd be like well fuck that I'm going to do I think as a, I think as a writer though you guys could talk to this is I think that's really what's fascinating that people who are afraid to write or to share that and, and get into different communities by telling other people's stories. I, I think uh, you get, you get in, entrenched in those communities and I think it's illuminating to me. I'm always fascinated. Yeah. Pete scares the shit out of me. Last week he takes me down to, we were at UCSD and UCSD. We we're talking quantum entanglement with this 33 year old <laughs> genius. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to have any questions. The same piece like Scott, can I happen to ask a fucking question? <laughs> You wouldn't I'm shut up. I wouldn't Why? shut up. I'm like, Pete, raise your hand if you got a fucking That's question. Right. But it, it, I'm just like, oh, I need to learn more about this. Knowing full well, I'll never know shit about quantum shit. But, but I, think, uh, I think it's about the way someone tells you about it. They might have had a cool way. They might have, I yeah. don't want to say dumbed it down, but you and I can talk about screenwriting and anybody would get it yeah. if we wanted to. Yeah. You know, yeah. We could talk about it. You wouldn't get it at all. You know what I mean? So I think it's just about how they... Yeah, you make it relatable. Right, Yeah, right. Yeah, I it's think that's true. It's storytelling, right. I don't know anything about quantum 
you know, <laughs> <Anything>. <laughs> physics really. Yeah. Very little. If but... we mixed in religion just to make it even more terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Yeah. It's, it's like juggling like with <laughs> knives blindfolded. You know? yeah. That's a rough one. That's a rough one. I got to listen to that podcast. It's that's crazy. Well, I think what's yeah. cool. You just you hit it on earlier too. You say like, yeah, I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to, you know, um, you, know you. You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. I think yeah. because that's kind of. I don't know what that spark is where you're driven to like, yeah, I'm going to start writing. And you know it's, it may be shit. Um, and I write a lot of shitty stuff too. And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get published. But um, I, I don't yeah. know what that, ca- what that catalyst is to say, I can do it. You guys are different. I well, talk, I but Go ahead. I, but I talk about this all the time. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know about <laughs> you. But I mean, I, I'm always questioning what the oh. fuck I'm doing out here. Yeah, you never think you've got it. Never. It scares the. Yeah. It, my job scares the shit out of me. Now, I, it, my life is not in jeopardy. Like yeah. a, if I was a firefighter yeah. or a race car driver or something. But I, it is. It is. I find it exis, existentially difficult to be a writer. You know, mm. and I'm and, and it's so cliche, but I am constantly filled with doubt. I don't know. On that know, level, yeah. He's yeah. an a list a list writer, and you still it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's you know, but I think there's. You know, and each project I do, I feel like I'm having to. You know, I I have some things that are I'm, I'm comfortable doing, right? Mm-hmm. Process wise, sure. right? There's some things that I know that if I get into trouble, I can jump to, right? Mm-hmm. That will help me craft. through it. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. craft, pure craft, mm-hmm. right? But it is a scary, it is a scary job. You know what I mean? And I, I don't care what level you're at. I think it's just a, you know, it, it's so true. Everybody thinks that because you're successful, that what are you worried about? Like you just yeah. wrote fucking, you know, so for, easy. For, for some, for what's next? Like, like with what's the, next? Well, well, here's, <laughs> here's what, are you, thing, what are you working on now? Here's when's the your thing next book that coming I'm out? excited about. Yeah. Is like, I'm writing this new series for Ridley Scott's company. Mm-hmm. Right. And I got the job and I was all excited. And then I went into that. Oh shit. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I could do this. Yeah. And then I went, what if I, of course I could do this because of it. And it, and when I realized, and I put out this tweet and it like a bunch of people chimed in up. And I said something like, you know you're doing the right project when you have a little bit of fear mm-hmm. and a little bit of excitement. Yeah. Because if you're like, oh, I got this, you're not going to have fun. Yeah, for sure. You're not going to be like, man, can I do this? And the, the anxiety sometimes is the thing that, that, uh, yeah. that, that keeps you moving. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it pushes you through it all. And that's why it takes 10 years sometimes. So a lot of it is, I don't think I could do it. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And sometimes. I you know think that's I mean? so true. Yeah. I mean, I, I think also, I, I don't know how you do it but when i get to that oh shit moment which is mm-hmm. always at some point in the pro it, it, might, right. it might i might start a project feeling very confident and i'll hit that moment mm-hmm. deeper in the project but i always hit that moment Absolutely. i think it is i gotta turn it on friday so i'm sitting there going oh, i don't shit. know if this yeah. is gonna be fair. <laughs> trust me <laughs> but i think that's I, I think that's that for me that's that moment you know that oh shit moment where i go back to the the basics like mm. what you know like why am i doing this movie you know Mm -hmm. like what is the what is that thing that that moved me in the Mm -hmm. beginning or that you know that grabs me by the throat Mm -hmm. when i first heard you know i think it forces that you gotta you you know you do have to hit that oh shit moment and then hopefully you go back to that i hate to use the word that pure place as a someone who's a an artist you Mm -hmm. know what i mean but you got to get to that place, and 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 I think you don't get there yeah. with hubris or confidence, or you know, you get there by sort of being vulnerable, yeah. and you know, that's how you step into that place, and that's where hopefully you find the cool stuff, and you don't always, but and I was just going to say to you um, is that in regard to your, you were talking about like gaining confidence or something earlier about people reading your stuff or whatever. I always tell writers what I was saying. I talk about this all the time, <clears throat> is. There are, speaking for screenplays in particular, right, there are a lot of competitions out there. A lot of them are good, and some of them are good, right? There's five or six of them that are the best, right? I always say this. Because people are like, well, how do you know when it's ready? I'm like, well, if you don't have your tribe, you know, your group of, oh, you know, I'm going to send it to Jason, let him take a look, mm-hmm. see if it's ready, right? Yeah. Send it to Pete, you know, whatever yeah. the hell it is. If you don't have your cats around you that are going to help you improve before you send it to your agent or your reps or whatever... Your tribe is now yeah. sending it to Austin Film Festival to see how you do. Yeah, that's you know? the best advice. And, yeah. and you send it to these competitions, and you spend $30, 40 $50, whatever the fuck it is, and you place. If you place, 
or if you're a quarter finalist, semi finalist, then you know where you are. Mm -hmm. And then you go, okay, I'm a quarter finalist in this. I still got work to do. But I was a quarter finalist in the best one. Yeah. Right. So I wonder if I sent this to final draft, how it would do over there. Right. Yeah. You send it to final draft and you place. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's how you start to guise exactly where you are sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've talked about this so many times with young writers about that's how you do it. If, if you don't have your tribe because you're not in L.A. or New York or somewhere else, that's how you can do it. It's just to see. You know, put it out yeah. there. And if it doesn't place, you still got some work to do. Yeah. I've, <laughs> you know I, mean, I mean, Pete's heard me say this. I, I sent sample chapters to those in my tribe too and marines we will eat our own for breakfast so if my guy <laughs> if my guys would have read any that's an honest said, group yeah, oh, yeah. that's yeah. an honest group. Be like scotty this sucks hit the price <laughs> right, do right. not send this to <laughs> an agent do not no right. but uh I, I i was really lucky to do exactly what you yeah. said and i and i love sharing that advice because um had i not sent the guys like you know being west and you know ollie north and just a ton of other guys that would have been uh, totally unvarnished with me like yeah it, but they said you know when i get a guy that's written 10 books about war and he says yeah. hey can i send this to my guy at random house tomorrow exactly like, what you want yeah please yeah. Yeah. Please, <laughs> please fucking please yeah. Yeah. and uh you know random house didn't buy it their loss uh so uh but i think that you guys just said something that's I think more of the norm and you've met so many guys and I always like to hear examples of them and name drop too. Cause we've interviewed some guys who are kind of fearless in the regard, like, and I'll use Billy Ray. Who's mm -hmm. a good friend of mine who yeah, is fearless about like, I can do this. I get this. I'm fucking writing. I don't tune into the internet. I spend 20 minutes for lunch and I'm back writing. And he is just, yeah, you, yeah. you've got the whole, and you I gotta love, be disciplined. You gotta yeah, be disciplined. absolutely. Yeah, sure. And, uh, I think that there's, there are a lot of great examples, but I don't think, the self doubt and the fear escape anyone no. at any level, and I can I can say that from my perspective is any level of being in the military or any any firefight or battle or level of command. There's still fear, but it's what you show, and it's all about great examples like you two to inspire people to continue doing. How important is that in what you do to try and pass that back on to inspire the writers? Absolutely. Well, I you know I. I think it's super important, and but I also think it's self-serving. I mean, when I talk to other writers, I don't for a minute feel that I have, you know, any more or less information than they do. I often learn. I learn from anybody I talk to. I mean, any fellow writer I talk to. Self, um, self-serving or self. Well, I'm gratifying. self. No. Well, both. I'm going to talk I'm, to Pete about podcasts. <laughs> no, but 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 both because you know self-serving in the in the sense that if I'm talking to another writer and they're sharing their process with me, there's something I may pull from their Absolutely. process, right? My, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. You talk mm -hmm. about reading screenplays and, and, you know, grabbing things, the mm -hmm. way people sort of, you know, put Every you know, single things on the screenplay. Of course, Every right? We, we probably all steal Over from Zalian. something of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we probably all, <laughs> exactly. it all probably comes from, but, but <clears throat> so it's self-serving. It's also gratifying, but the, there is... I really, I, I love writers and I really do think of, I do think of artists, you know, what the discipline is doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I could learn how to be a better writer talking to a painter, mm -hmm. right? And talking about that person's process that, that in my mind, there's no difference, mm. right? So I love mm. sort of talking to, you know, anybody who is pursuing a creative yeah. life, you know, because I, I think that that creative process is the same all the way around so uh, you know i god I, I love it i mean you know it's funny you, you bring up being in a firefight you know you know it, it, and excuse me for 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 the analogy of a firefight and writing but you know when you get into a when you get into a problem <laughs> it's, the it's the same right when you get into a when you, when you get into a problem with writing I, I found that it is about moving forward, right? right? It's like, that's the mm. thing I would tell any writer who is maybe starting out, you know, and we all get there to a point where you're like, oh, I, I don't know what the fuck to do. Mm -hmm. Or this idea that I had isn't working. It's <laughs> always about moving forward, right? And trying different ideas or talking it out with your tribe, you know, or or just getting up in the morning and and doing the work every day and you move through those little things. I, I see too many writers who they, they, they start off full of confidence and inspiration and it's good stuff. And then they get to the midpoint of the screenplay <laughs> and it's that Rocky moment and they just shut down. 
yeah. you know, and and it's uh, you know I think it's about moving up the field. And as you can much always you can. tell because you're like, oh, and they're like, oh, I'm writing this new script and working on it for like six months. I'm like, well, what what page are you on? They're like, page forty five, and like. Yeah, right. Or page 50, yeah, like they're always around mm-hmm. between 45 and 60. Like that's the first quarter of Jason's movie. That's Somewhere around there. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. That's, that's the thing funny about his 200-page script. Oh, that's like the, yeah, that, that's, that's the funny thing I was going to ask you is... <laughs> I'm just asking you because I'm so full funny. of shit. By the way, here it no, is. No, I'm no, like, no. oh, let me, let's talk. About, let's talk about craft. I'm like, oh yeah, I turned yeah. into 220. But, so but, unprofessional. Yeah. But you, you know? turned into 220 <laughs> because there was so much information. So much there. Right. Yeah. You got it back down to whatever page it became. I yeah. forgot what it was. I remember looking at. It. Um, but you get it down to let's say 125, yeah. whatever. But that's where the craft comes in. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just had to get it out. Yeah. You know, you had to tell that whole story to go, oh, okay, let me focus on these two characters. And I had four. Yeah. Let me focus, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. I had to work it out. I mean, yeah. I couldn't solve the problem of which story to tell, so mm-hmm. I just right. kept moving. Mm-hmm. I always felt that story would have been a better TV show. I, I mean, right. I really, I felt it was a 10-hour, you know, yeah. HBO limited series, limited series because it was that, you know, all the other stories that got dropped right. We're so good. You Sounds know. like it's still not too late, though. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I, I mean, don't know. The, maybe. Since it came out, <laughs> yeah. it did yeah. good, and maybe there's an opportunity. I mean, yeah. your movie <clears throat> that you wrote with everybody else, obviously included in it, you know, inspired me to go back and watch Adam Carolla's documentary, go read. Oh, the, the 24 Hour War. Yeah, 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 yeah and just yeah, all yeah. that stuff, because it was just so rich. And so I wanted to make sure I say that because it was really fantastic and I really enjoyed it. But also, when you hear that Hilliard not only sees the movie, but looks up at your script and, you know, knows how many pages approximately yeah. it is. When you're writing, are you thinking about your peers who are going to look at your work and get under the hood? 100%. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's because I do it too. Card. So yeah. Of course. But I, also, I do it too. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, if I see a movie and I love the movie or, or, or a writer that I particularly admire, yeah. I'll get everything that they write mm-hmm. because I'm wanting to see sort of, you know, what you were talking about. You how see they, the growth too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. how they do things yeah. and how do they handle that? And, and so, and for sure, I'm, and I think that comes from not having had anything produced for 10 years, yeah. right? It became that and hundred something shifted, about. something shifted yes. finally, but, yeah. but it became about that 115, 20 pages. Like mm-hmm. I really looked at a screenplay as I thought my lot in life was, this will just be all you'll ever get to experience yeah. is writing a really good 120 pages that you feel good about. So I just, that was, that was it. So I do read screenplays now, like, People maybe read books, you know. I mean, you see, I really. Did you see you? Ford versus Ferrari? Yeah, the screenplay was so much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's what these fucking guys say when they're like, but you know, it's hanging funny. out, I, drinking I, coffee. I tell people all the time. <laughs> I wish. I actually read scripts and I actually skip over a lot of dialogue. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by how how people write the descriptions and how yeah, they yeah. write the actions and how they transition. I'm looking at that, and when people hmm. read my script, they're like, wow. dude, the way you. Man, it was like, bam, page one, I was in. Yeah. And at the bottom, there was a big explosion. It's like, whatever. Like, I know how to, it should be pretty on the page. Well, you know, I'll you tell know? you, a guy who, who, you know, I don't know if you have you know, read a lot of Eric Roth stuff, right. but man, that guy changed the way I looked at screenwriting. Okay. When I started reading, you know, cause like you, I'm just always reading people. When I start, read my first Eric Roth script, and this is a guy, this is one of the great living, this is one of the great living screenwriters right deep, now. Yeah. I mean, this guy is, this guy is just the best, you know, um, his, his, the way that it was prose, you know what I mean? The way he described a scene. And lean. Uh, no, it, well, well, Eric early was, was, Oh, he was dense before he, he was dense. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he would describe a scene, you know, that, that fit in a novel. I mean, yeah. it was that mm-hmm. beautifully written mm-hmm. and, it changed the way I looked at screenplays, mm-hmm. you know, because they can be pretty dry, right. right? Screenplays can be really basic, but a guy like Eric Roth, Z- is aliens the same way, mm-hmm. right? You read him and, and suddenly, yes, yeah, suddenly mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I'm, this is this is a this is almost this is literature. Mm-hmm. It's beautifully written. Mm-hmm. How is this scene described? Is beautifully and they talk know, to you yeah. and they talk to you yeah. and you be so that you know when i started reading those guys i i, I was like oh man this isn't just a blueprint mm-hmm. a screenplay can be a wonderful piece of writing in and of itself right. um so that was a oh, cool totally thing. Agree. Totally yeah. agree. i was gonna say one last thing i it just so happened about six months ago i listened to there's a podcast called business wars mm. you heard of it no 
They did a whole thing on Ford vs. Ferrari. Oh, really? Dude, it's fucking amazing. Business Wars. Yeah, Business oh, Wars. Wow. Check amazing. it out. It's amazing. That's great. It's amazing. Cool. Hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Did you have a good time? This is fun. Yeah, good. I love it. Perfect. Yeah. Where do people go to find you? At my social house? media? At my house? <laughs> social media. <laughs> Probably no, do I, not give your address I, I, out I, on the app. Yeah. No, I'm not on social media. No? I don't have, I don't do that. Lucky. They can, they can call Pete. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it down, show. <laughs>